I call the subcommittee on housing, transportation and community development to order. Today, we are going to take a look at community development financial institutions or CDFIs. Our hearing will explore how the federal government can help support their innovative work and how we can work together to address some of the challenges faced by underserved communities when it comes to accessing capital and the financial system. The COVID-19 pandemic has not been the great equalizer. It has laid bare the disparities in our society that existed before the pandemic. And too often it is black and brown and indigenous families who have faced the most significant burdens. But the economic disparities didn't start, as I said, during the pandemic. According to the Federal Reserve, as of 2019, a typical black family's net worth was just 15% of a typical white family's worth. A typical Hispanic family's net worth was about 19% of a white family's. And the typical net worth for Native American families is also just a fraction of the typical white families. While there are many causes for this great inequity, one factor is a lack of access to capital and to financial services for people of color, indigenous communities, and in small towns and rural places. When the CDFI fund, the federal agency that oversees CDFI programs, when it was established in 1994, there were about 80 CDFIs. Today, there are more than a thousand, many with innovative models that weren't even imagined when the CDFI fund was first established. And they've played a critical role in bringing capital and financial services to a wide variety of underserved communities from urban areas to small towns and rural places to tribal lands. For instance, in Minnesota, the African Development Center helped fund two malls that have more than 450 African small businesses and over 500 jobs. The Indian Land Company, the ILCC, Indian Land Capital Company, forgive me, made a loan of nearly 1 million to the Lower Sioux to allow them to expand their land by about 10%. I appreciated the opportunity to visit with them last summer and learn more about this project. And in 2018, I visited the University Enterprise Labs, which was funded in part by Sunrise Banks, which is a certified CDFI with support from the New Markets Tax Credit Program. Those funds have helped expand a cutting edge life sciences incubator in an area that is currently shared by industrial uses and students on the border of St. Paul and Minneapolis. With their successful track record of re reaching underserved communities, Congress has looked to CDFIs as effective community development organizations to implement programs. So here's just a few examples. In 2000, Congress enacted the New Markets Tax Credit, which provides tax incentives to allow CDFIs to work on economic development projects in economically distressed areas. That program has proven successful, and I'm glad to be a supporter of it. A bipartisan legislation from Senator Cardin and Senator Blunt to update and expand that tax credit. During the Great Recession, Senator Menendez um, authored legislation to establish the CDFI Bond Guarantee Program. The Bond Guarantee Program provides stable, long-term sources of capital for CDFIs without any subsidy from taxpayers. Earlier this week, Senator Rounds and I introduced legislation to make that program permanent and to adjust some of its loan requirements to make it more accessible to smaller CDFIs who might want to participate. I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses today about how our legislation could make a difference for community development. In 2020, Congress set aside $25 billion of PPP lending for CDFIs to distribute because CDFIs have relationships with many communities that banks and credit unions just weren't able to reach. CDFIs made more than 100,000 PPP loans in the first months of that program, and that effort was critical to helping thousands of small businesses stay afloat. In addition, in the bipartisan year-end funding package that we enacted at the end of 2020, Congress made an historic investment in CDFIs and minority depository institutions, providing rapid relief grants. As a result of that program, 27 Minnesota CDFIs received grants totaling 
38 million dollars funds that will be invested in our state to support new lending and services. Senator Warner played an important role in getting this investment enacted, and I know that many of us supported the work that he's done. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about how that funding is making a difference in their communities. So before I turn to Senator Rounds, I'd like to thank Mike for being such a good partner in planning um, and organizing this hearing. As you were saying at the beginning, this is a hearing where we tend to focus on what we can find agreement on, on where we can find common ground and um, approach this from a perspective of solutions. And, and, um, and that's very important. I know that we have a shared interest in building strong communities in our states and around the country, and especially in supporting economic development and access to capital in the indigenous communities that both of our states um, share. As I mentioned before, uh, yesterday we joined together to introduce uh, together legislation to update the CDFI bond guarantee program to make it more available for smaller CDFIs. And we have also done legislation together to support access to mortgages for Native Americans in a partnership between CDFIs and the US Department of Agriculture. So I'm hopeful that today's hearing will help us identify additional areas where we can work together and pave a path to advancing these important pieces of legislation and others that we'll hear about today. So Senator Rounds, thank you so much for your partnership and you are now recognized. But thank you, Madam Chair, and, and let me reciprocate as well. I, I most certainly have appreciated the opportunity to work directly with you and your team. Um, I think this is the way the legislative process should work and I've appreciated your openness to having these discussions and I look forward to additional legislation uh, uh, being an item that can be moved forward from the subcommittee and uh, perhaps actually making some very positive changes throughout the Midwest and hopefully across the rest of the country. So I thank you for your leadership and I thank you for your, your, your interest in cooperating and in working together. Uh, I also wanna thank uh, our witnesses for taking the time to virtually attend today's hearing. I would especially like to thank Ms. Lakota Vogel from my home state of South Dakota uh, and for her willingness to testify. I look forward to hearing from all of you. Uh, community Development Financial Institutions or CDFIs, <clears throat> excuse me, are critical uh, in, in um, rural South Dakota as they provide services to the underserved communities that often fall through the cracks of our traditional financial systems. It is because of these institutions that many can buy their first home or launch a business that will bring much needed jobs to a rural community. Today, however, I mainly wanna focus my remarks on the impact native CDFIs have on native populations, as well as the challenges which they still face. Native CDFIs are unique because they are anchored in local culture and are passionate about creating opportunities for long-term growth. As members of the community themselves, staff members know how to bridge the gap between cash economies and traditional financial products. They also play an important role in laying the groundwork for new investment in Native communities by providing access to capital, financial assistance, and literacy. This results in new native-led businesses, uh, opportunities for entrepreneurship, and additional jobs. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Oftentimes, native CDFIs are the first encounter native families and individuals have with financial institutions. Because native CDFIs serve a large unbanked population, they will often refer individuals to a local bank to open an account, many of whom are the first in their generation to do so and begin a journey towards financial stability. A recent study by the Minneapolis Fed found that trust between a borrower and a lender is critical for a successful loan. And since native CDFIs design their services to include a cultural element, they can better build that trust. By providing financial workshops, training and counseling that integrate cultural values in community specific situations, native CDFIs lead to more robust credit building. The Minneapolis Fed researchers also found that establishing native CDFIs on or near reservations can improve individuals' credit outcomes. What is best for the 5,000 person town of Eagle Butte, South Dakota is different from what is best for native populations in the Black Hills of South Dakota 
And since they are able to tailor their programs to their specific community, they find more success. The Minneapolis Fed reported that adding just one native CDFI staff member per 1,000 residents leads on average to a 45 point increase in the Equifax risk score of individuals who had low credit worthiness. Even though native CDFIs are able to be effective, they still face challenges. Adequate capital access continues to be a problem as demand in native areas is outpacing supply. The chair and I have worked on several pieces of legislation to try and increase access to this much needed capital. Last year, we introduced the American Rural Home Ownership Improvement Act, which would expand a USDA 502 lending pilot program where USDA partnered with native CDFIs to employ loans to eligible native borrowers. Senator Smith and I also introduced legislation today that would lower the minimum bond offered by the CDFI bond guarantee program from $100 million to $25 million in order to increase access to smaller CDFIs like native CDFIs. These are just a few of the ways we've tried to address this problem and I look forward to exploring this issue and others uh, during this hearing. Again, we welcome all of you here today to our first subcommittee hearing of 2022. And I look forward to hearing from our witnesses uh, on native CDFIs and traditional CDFIs. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Senator Rounds. I am now going to introduce our witnesses. I'm so grateful uh, to all of you for joining us today. I will introduce all three of you um, at once and then turn to each of you uh, to make your opening statements. Um, first, I'd like to welcome John Holdsclaw IV as president as the CDFI Coalition and Executive Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at the Nat National Cooperative Bank in Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome, Mr. Holdsclaw. I'm delighted to welcome Frank Altman, who is the founder and CEO of Community Reinvestment Fund USA, based in my hometown of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Welcome, Frank. And also, it's wonderful to have join us today Lakota Vogel, who is Executive Director of the Four Bands Community Fund in Eagle Butte, South Dakota. Welcome, uh, Lakota, Ms. Vogel. Um, welcome to all of you for your willingness to speak with us today. And before you begin your opening statements, I have a few reminders. Once you start speaking, there will be a slight de delay before you are displayed on the screen. And to minimize any background noise, please click the mute button until it is your turn to speak or to ask questions. You should all have uh, one box on your screens labeled clock that will show how much time you have remaining. For witnesses, you will have five minutes for your opening statements and your full written, written statements will be made part of the record. For all senators, the five minute clock applies for your questions. When you have about 30 seconds remaining for your statements or questions, you'll hear a little bing, a little bell ring to remind you that your time is almost expired and it will ring again when your time has expired. And if there is any technology issue, we will move to the next witness or senator until we get it resolved. To simplify the speaking order process for senators, Senator Rounds and I have agreed to go by seniority for this hearing as we are fully virtual. And we will proceed first through subcommittee members by seniority and then turn to any non subcommittee members in order of seniority who wish to ask questions. Um, I will now turn to Mr. Holtzclaw for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. Chairwoman Smith, Senator Rounds, and members of the subcommittee. My name is John Holtzclaw IV, and I am the president of the CDFI Coalition and EVP of Strategic Initiatives at the National Cooperative Bank. Thank you for this opportunity today to testify on the CDFI fund and success of CDFIs in delivering financial services to underserved low-income urban, rural, and native communities. The CDFI Coalition is a national membership organization made up of more than 150 organizations, including loan funds, community development banks, community development corporations, venture funds, micro lenders, Native American organizations, and credit unions. The fund established in 1994 has emerged as a key policy apparatus for revitalizing disadvantaged communities, especially those hit very hard during the COVID pandemic. However, 
Before the pandemic, low-income communities, rural, tribal, and communities of color faced significant obstacles in assessing financial services. Today, the fund has more than 1,300 certified CDFIs across the country providing com community development and lending services in all sizes and types of communities. These CDFIs leverage $12 in private capital for every dollar in federal support. In FY22, the CDFI Fund Financial Assistance Awards unleashed $39 billion in loans and investments to 125,000 businesses and millions of, of individuals. They financed 50,000 uh, units of affordable housing and thousands of nonprofits and, and facilities. Native CDFIs have made $1.6 billion in loans and investments. In regards to PPP or the Paycheck Protection Plan, Congress established a set aside, and according to uh, SBA, through May of 2020, CF, CFIs or community financial institutions, including CDFIs, made 1.3 million PPP loans, totaling 30 billion or 21% of all the loans. The average loan size was 21,000 compared to 41,000 across all other lending classes. For example, 78% of all uh, community financial institution PPP loans went to businesses requesting less than 250,000. Moreover, 15.7% of all of those community uh, financial institutions made loans were made to businesses in rural communities, closely keeping with the 16.6% .6 of all the loans uh, that went to rural businesses. So with the recent growth in the industry, it presents both opportunities and challenges. The federal government, and thank you, has made an unprecedented investment into CDFIs over the past several years with the hope of scaling the industry and expanding its impact. However, Congress and the CDFI fund can do more to scale the CDFI movement while ensuring that certified CDFIs maintain their role as trusted mission-driven lenders in underserved communities. The CDFI coalition urges Congress to provide 1 billion in annual appropriations for CDFI assistance programs through the CDFI fund. The CDFI coalition urges Congress to invest more in CDFIs by increasing the annual authorization level to, to 1 billion for the CDFI fund. We believe that this will result in the financing of an additional 100,000 affordable housing units, thousands of loans and investments in child care centers, health centers and community facilities, nearly 2 million consumer and home ownership loans and hundreds of thousands of loans of investments in businesses in targeted area. The CDFI fund also strongly encourages Congress to build the administrative capacity of the fund to sustain the recent momentum and growth in the industry. Congress should provide additional resources to the agency to administer a growing portfolio of financial assistance awards, bonds, and tax credits. We also support uh, the Bond Guarantee Improvement Act. Thank you, Senator Smith, and thank you, Senator Rounds, that was introduced yesterday. The permanent extension and other improvements contained in that legislation have the potential to further prompt revitalization and distress in rural communities. All said, thank you again for the opportunity to be here today to talk about the impact of community financial institutions, community development financial institutions or CDFIs. And I welcome the opportunity to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now turn to Mr. Altman. I believe you're muted. Oh, there we go. All right, let's start again. Thank you, uh, Senator Chair uh, Smith, Ranking Member Rounds, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I am pleased to participate in this important hearing, discuss the role of CDFIs in supporting underserved communities. I'm Frank Altman, CEO and co-founder of Community Reinvestment Fund. We are a national CDFI based in Minneapolis, whose mission is to help improve lives and strengthen communities through innovative financial solutions. We were certified as a CDFI in 2009. However, we've been active as an organization since uh, 1988. So we've been around for more than 30 years uh, working in these markets. Uh, C CRF has been the beneficiary of six financial assistance awards and the rapid response grant. Uh, we have uh, received uh, $919.5 million in new market tax credit allocations uh, across uh, since the beginning of the NMTC program, uh, and we've also issued 
uh, $940 million in bonds on behalf of eight CDFIs as a qualified issuer for the CDFI bond guarantee program. Uh, since our founding, we have deployed more than $3.5 billion in financing and serving more than 2.3 million people. And we have made loans to small businesses in more than a thousand, mostly low income communities in all 50 states in, and the District of Columbia, creating or preserving more than 156,000 jobs. Uh, early on in response to the need for liquidity for revolving loan funds and uh, organizations that uh, were lending in these communities, we created the first secondary market for community development loans and issued the first asset backed securities collateralized by these assets. Our vision was to connect community, ba community based lenders to private investors in the public capital markets and we continue to work on uh, toward that effort. Over the years, we funded more than 9,000 small business loans, two thirds of which went to businesses owned by women or people of color. And our deep expertise in small business lending led us to obtain an SBA uh, non-bank national uh, 7A license, uh, one of now three uh, non-bank CDFIs offering this product nationally. Today, I wanna to focus my remarks particularly on uh, the work that we've done in uh, both nationally and in Minnesota uh, to reflect on what we've learned uh, CRF has a long history of partnering with other CDFIs. Uh, we have worked with more than 250 CDFIs and development finance agencies over the years, both nationally and in the Twin Cities. And in Minneapolis, more than a decade ago, we made more than 100 subordinate loans to support small businesses along Lake Street, Franklin Avenue, and uh, uh, primarily in the Phillips and Powderhorn Park neighborhoods. Uh, we did this in partnership with local banks and other CDFIs, and our efforts uh, to uh, joint efforts revitalized these neighborhoods, resulting in a 62% decline in crime from 1998 to 2009 and rising property values. This lending laid the foundation for a major redevelopment project uh, of the Midtown Exchange, uh, a, a former Sears distribution center with uh, long vacant for, vacant for more than 10 years uh, with 202 million square feet, uh, a very daunting project to redo. Uh, but the city, working with the city at, and the strategy that the city had for this uh, development, uh, CRF and two other uh, CDFIs were able to provide tax credits uh, from the New Markets Tax Credit Program to redevelop this building uh, in, into a mixed use building, including the headquarters for Alina Health, uh, the Alina Commons portion of this, this project, uh, bringing at the headquarters of a, of a major uh, a nonprofit financial health care system uh, into uh, this very uh, low-income neighborhood. And nearby, uh, it, in uh, uh, the same neighborhood, we used New Markets tax credits to finance the Banyan community uh, a few blocks from the Midtown Exchange. Banyan uh, supports more than 150 children with early childhood education and child care and after-school programs uh, in a very low-income community. Sadly, the murder of George Floyd erased much of the progress we made in the Powderhorn Park neighborhood, but we stand ready to be a supporter in rebuilding uh, this area along Lake Street uh, and others with, uh, uh, with funds uh, that we are receiving and have received from the CDFI fund and others. The, the pandemic uh, uh, is, uh, has caused, oh, I'm gonna run way out of time, sorry about this. I'll get, I'll get back to this in the question area, but thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Altman. We'll have a chance to hear the rest of your uh, comments, I'm sure. Um, and next, um, we'll hear from Ms. Vogel. Thank you, Chairwoman Smith, Ranking Member Rounds, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I'm honored to have been included as a voice in this important hearing to share the successes and challenges of CDFI serving underestimated communities across the nation. My name is Lakota Vogel. I'm an enrolled member of the Shine River Sioux Tribe, born and raised on a ranch in South Dakota. I'm the executive director of Four Bands Community Fund. It's a 22-year-old rural native CDFI that started by serving all residents of the Shine River Sioux Reservation in North Central South Dakota and expanded in 2013 to serve native entrepreneurs across the entire state. I'm on the executive committee of the South Dakota Native Homeownership Coalition and a member of the Mountain Plains Regional Native CDFI Coalition. I'm here today to share the perspective of on the ground leaders within the native CDFI movement, which spans about 69 separate organizations operating across 27 states. The core of our mission and purpose of our programming is aimed at leveling inequities, stemming from a historic lack of investment and in access to capital, as well as non-inclusive policies in the communities we serve. 
With over two decades of experience, Four Bands Community Fund has continuously improved our products and services to successfully deploy over $25 million across the state. We utilize an integrated approach in lending, which um, ranking member rounds mentioned, fuse, it fuses relationship building and learning with loan products. Our suite of programs are designed to revive traditional culture and support self-sufficiency by focusing on two core areas, entrepreneurship and consumer lending and home ownership. So within the entrepreneur sp entre entrepreneurship space, Four Bands offers a comprehensive business training program alongside of customized business coaching. We also have several products to help entrepreneurs access capital um, up to $250,000 and they can use that capital for inventory, um, leasehold improvements, really any commercial purpose. We also operate a business incubator that provides physical space in addition to our entrepreneur programming for at least six businesses with, in the community of Eagle Butte, South Dakota. Our average business loan client is a female head of household who dreams of starting a business in the service industry that doesn't require a lot of startup capital. It could be like a restaurant, a daycare, a hair salon. In turn, these industries have a thin profit margin and have more difficulty accessing capital from financial institutions because of their small dollar nature and small balance sheet. Four Bands has deployed over $200 million to the small business sector, or 20, I wish 200 million, $20 million to the small business sector, resulting in the creation and expansion of over 300 native owned um, businesses across the state. And we can proudly say due to lots of innovation and partners like CRF and Frank Altman and resource stacking, we did not lose one small business during the pandemic across the state that was within our portfolio. The other core area we focus on is consumer and home ownership. So a unique challenge within our communities is invisible credit histories. We are fortunate to have four financial institutions serving the Shire University Reservation, but only one of them, the credit union, reports to the credit bureaus. So we have generations of borrowers utilizing debt tools for decades at the local financial institutions, and they remain invisible. And it's not due to any individual borrower choices or behaviors, but it's due to institutional decisions. Four bands began reporting to the credit bureaus in 2010. Our foresight and community mindedness has primed our market for home ownership. So as our balance sheet grew, we were finally able to offer mortgage products to our community in 2019 in partnership with USDA as one of the pilot sites for the 502 direct lending program. We were able to close eight mortgages and spurred the demand to close a total of 42 mortgages on Shine River within one and a half years. My recommendations today are simple. Advance the Native American Rural Home Ownership Improvement Act. Thank you to Chairwoman Smith and Ranking Member Rounds for co-sponsoring this leg legislation. Um, access to these funds should include all Native CDFIs across the nation. The second recommendation I have is just increase the Native American CDFI assistance appropriations to 50 million to meet the, the needs. Um, our, our program needs are increasing across the nation and the annual appropriations for NACA have remained stagnant since 2014. All of this to say the tool, the native CDFI tool works. It's just chronically undercapitalized. We're part of the communities we serve. We run into our clients at the grocery store. We sit on the daycare board of directors desperately trying to keep these vital programs running. And as native CDFI staff and community members, we're woven into the fabric of the community in almost every aspect of our clients' financial lives. There's no comparison to sitting across from our clients at tax time, assessing their earnings for the year and planning for the future. We're the gentle nudge to savings accumulation and the sounding board for many of the financial decisions our families make. We believe how you perceive is how you proceed. We perceive opportunity because our success as nation builders is intricately woven into the success of our neighbor. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you so much, Ms. Vogel. I appreciate all of your testimony really so much. We're now going to turn to our um, first round of questions and um, I'll begin. Um, so let me, I'd like to first uh, drill down a little bit onto the CDFI bond guarantee program. Uh, we noted uh, Senator Menendez who is um, joining us today was the, um, worked on this back at the, beginning um, started this back at the beginning of the um, during the Great Recession and yesterday Senator Rounds and I introduced a bill that would reauthorize and update the bond guarantee program um, and as um, was mentioned in um, the, your testimony our bill would reduce the program's loan size requirements so that it could be more accessible uh, to smaller CDFIs and for smaller community development projects. 
Mr. Altman, let me turn to you first. Could you share some examples with us of how the changes that Senator Rounds and I are proposing might help get more capital into the hands of smaller CDFIs and ultimately into the communities that they serve? Sure. Thank, thank you, Chair Smith. The bond guarantee program is a vital program uh, in the CDFI toolbox, uh, yet it's only been used by about 26 CDFIs. And, and the biggest barrier to utilization has been the need to either come together as, as a group to obtain a $100 million uh, bond or to uh, be a large enough organization that a balance sheet can, can support $100 million in debt. Uh, and so that's limited the CDFI bond guarantee to really the largest CDFIs uh, in the country. Uh, and in a few cases, there have been groups of CDFIs that have come together, uh, but it's very difficult because if one CDFI uh, in the group decides that it has to wait, uh, that can just make the program inaccessible for all the other CDFIs that are coming together. So by lowering the bond size to 25 million, we believe that many more CDFIs will be able to be uh, at, at, to access this, uh, this vital program. Uh, and why is it so vital? Uh, it provides very low cost, long-term debt uh, to, to the balance sheets of CDFIs. So it can be used to match fund long-term assets, particularly in affordable housing, daycare, and other facilities that, uh, that need long-term financing. So it's a very, very powerful program uh, if we can put it together uh, in a slightly different way. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Vogel, um, would you like to comment on this as well and how this somehow um, you can see this being an advantageous to native CDFIs? You know, honestly, um, we support all of the, the CDFI industry, industry is great in that we all support one another. And I trust Frank and um, John and the work that they do with the advocacy, you know, as, as a person on the ground doing the work. Um, it's nice to have the big brothers out there watching out for these things. And so we've been getting updates from them on passing this. So we definitely support the legislation that's been, you know, advanced by you and ranking member rounds. So we are looking forward to learning more from CRF and the CDFI coalition about how we can better utilize the program, but longer term debt um, to match what's needed within our community, you know, sounds like a win to me. Thank you so much. Let me ask you, um, I'll stay with you, Ms. Vogel. Uh, Senator Rounds mentioned this, as did I, that we, he and I have introduced legislation to make permanent a program to expand access to mortgages in tribal communities. Our bill is based on a pilot that USDA has been conducting in South Dakota in which they partner with native CDFIs uh, to make loans under the USDA's Section 502 mortgage lending program. And I know that you've been involved in this pilot program. Could you just talk a little bit with us about how the pilot program help to serve the Cheyenne River Sioux and, and what you see as the community benefit of this um, of this strategy. Yeah, as I mentioned before, um, there haven't been any private mortgages on Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation for a very long time. If there are mortgages that's wrapped into a small business loan or an ag loan or a personal loan. And so the USDA capital allowed us to develop a mortgage product for the market. And I hate to even say the word mortgage within my market because it spurred such a demand there where we've had a pipeline of over, you know, $18 million of demand for mortgage products. So the 502 product allowed us the longer term debt capital to begin serving the market and priming for home ownership. Without that, um, we wouldn't have been able to deploy the 42 mortgages that we've closed in the year and a half that we've been operating the product. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, the partnership with Senator Rounds on this. And um, I think I'll turn to uh, uh, the questioning now to Senator Rounds. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Vogel, I'm going to continue with you for just a minute. And, and, and that is, uh, as Senator uh, Smith has indicated and, and has talked a little bit about, I, I really think it's important to talk about the USDA 502 pilot program and the reason why it was successful there uh, at, at, you know, within North Central South Dakota, you're talking about a rural area and you're talking about an area which is on the reservation, which means that a lot of the land is in tribal trust. And since it's in tribal trust, is that one of the reasons why we're really looking for um, a local understanding of what it means to, to be able to get a mortgage and how you actually get title to the land and so forth. Can you talk about that a little bit in terms of how critical 
this particular uh, 502 lending program is and how it might impact other tribal trust land areas as well? Yeah, I think it goes back to relationship lending and all CDFIs are based off of relationship lending. So while tribal trust is has its complexities, it's really about the CDFIs walking alongside with their customers down to the BIA Realty Office to begin processing the paperwork instead of me remaining in my desk and sending my client you know, down the path of where they should go next, we actually walk with them through that process. And so the relationships that we hold on the ground, taking donuts to the realty officer, so they speed up the TSR certification process, it's all a little trick of the trade and, and the importance of us being here and understanding what it means to develop homes within our community. So yes, on the ground is important, understanding how homeownership affects community development, ultimately economic development is important to that. Tribal trust, is complex, but anybody can do it if you're willing to invest in your community. The Four Bands Community Fund, um, which is the name of your organization, t tell me, because I think there's a lot of folks out there that maybe don't understand how small we really are. How many folks actually work? Uh, how many lenders do you have? How many, how many staff members do you have there? I have eight staff members, um, nine including myself, but really just three that are working on the lending side because we offer the technical assistance and the program development. We have another, you know, more team focusing on the education components within the community. We talk about uh, first generation individuals that are actually getting involved in financial institutions and lending. Can you share a little bit about the, about the challenges of moving from, from a, a cash economy to one in which you have a relationship with a lender and the, the expertise and the walking through the steps of what you do for an individual member or family when they come in. Just an, an, an average family in terms of somebody on the res, they're, they're in the ag community or whatever, and they come in and they're looking for a way to, to try to get into a home or to start a business. What, what do you find in terms of the challenges they face? I mean, the first thing is just lack of infrastructure. So, you know, you have a, a, a daycare or a Head Start teacher, a cook, you know, a grandma that's caring for three children. She walks into the building and says, I want to buy a home for my, my goal is to retire and take care of my three grandchildren. And the first thing she do, does is find land to put the house on. And the hard part is getting electric, water, sewer, and things like that. So what we're asking individuals in rural economies to do is to develop peace meal the infrastructure needed to grow the economies and it's difficult for them because that's an outside cost of the loan to value generally the infrastructure improvements aren't included in loan to value in traditional financial institutions so cdfis can adjust and view those as part of the loan to value um, you know it, it really is just that that small town relationship building but our average um, AGI is 27,000, which is you know half of what the state of South Dakota is earning. So a lot of our families are looking to be brought into their mainstream financial institutions and that takes money and time. And that's what John Holtzclaw was advocating for of funding the CDFI fund at the level it's needed. So then the money can trickle out to us and support our administrative costs to provide the services that are needed within our communities. You it's know, all I'm, part I'm, of the system. I'm no, that's okay. Look, I, I, and I know I'm going to run out of time, but I, I, I want to get to one more question for sure. Private companies, including larger banks, are partnering with CDFIs across the country to make a social impact on distressed communities or communities that have got, you know, first generation borrowers. Ms. Bogo, could you discuss how larger private financial institutions like Wells Fargo in South Dakota are partnering with native CDFIs like yours? to increase access to capital. Yes, and that was also mentioned in John's testimony of saying we leverage every dollar of federal investment is leveraged, you know, at least 12 times with different investments. So we're going after different pots of funny funding through corporate investments like Wells Fargo to build back, you know, the, the business economies and community economies that we're operating within. Great, so, so you, you have a partner there. This is an opportunity to perhaps get more of the private lenders actively involved where they literally don't find a path forward right now. Right, and foundations. We have a historic lack of investment in philanthropy in the rural native regions, and so we need philanthropy and corporations to step up. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And once again, th thanks for putting together this particular uh, committee hearing today. I think this is really important, and this is one area where we absolutely can make a difference, uh, and this is bipartisan in nature. And I think uh, 
Chairman Smith, I really do appreciate your, your, your leadership on this and your interest in finding a path forward that really would make a difference in a lot of our, our rural areas. Thank you so much, Senator Rounds. Um, that's great. On our next, uh, I'll now turn to Senator Reed. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman, and uh, Senator Rounds also uh, to your leadership on this issue. It's, it's vitally important and uh, something that touches everywhere. Uh, Ms. Vogel, uh, there are so many people that are unbanked or underbanked, and uh, they are at the mercy many times of payday lenders. Uh, can you share your experience with providing sustainable and affordable small dollar loans to members of your community? Yes, I can. Thank you, Senator. Um, you know, Four Bands has been providing a credit builder loan at 11% interest um, for some time now, and we chose to have a lower interest rate to keep it affordable to the family. But we were involved in a state initiative to cap the interest rate in the state of South Dakota at 36%, which was successfully passed. And since then, we've not seen payday lenders show up within the credit histories of our clients that come through. Um, and they've successfully been able to access other products um, to meet that short-term cash need within the household. And it's helped us to have that capped interest rate and to not hurt the families. Well, it also indicates that you seem to be able to function and survive and prosper as well as commercial banks in the state with the 36% interest gap. Is that accurate? Yes, it is. And it's a business decision. It's just like any other business decision. If you have a loss leader, which the credit builder product doesn't necessarily bring us the best income, but you have other products that can offset the cost for that administrative expense to offer the, the important product to the community. As you know, under the Military Lending Act, uh, which I was actively involved with, we've established 36% interest uh, limit on loans to service members. And we have legislation now that extend that to everyone. Um, do you, what impact would that have nationwide? I presume from your experience in South Dakota, it is very progressive South Dakota, that uh, it would not have an adverse impact. I don't, I don't think it would have an adverse impact. I believe in American innovation. And I think that if you cap the interest rate, it would keep products safe and affordable for the families that are the most vulnerable. And there would be innovative products that would be released onto the market that could fit the need and you know fill the gap that was left a void there. Thank you very much. And thank you for your work. And indeed, all of you for your great work. Mr. Holtzclore, uh, one of the impressions I had about the, the first round of PPP is that the big banks uh, got there first, grabbed the money for their big clients, and small business men and women, particularly minority communities, found nothing. They, they were, in fact, I got calls, as I'm sure my colleagues did, from many small business restaurants, et cetera. We'd had relationships with these banks for years, couldn't get anything out of them. And that's why I think one of the reasons uh, the second time around we made sure CDFI had. Uh, a role in distributing the money. Uh, can you talk about that? Uh, I think indeed you made a decisive impact on getting money to the rural area where it's needed, the small business people, and leaving it to the big folks. Uh, we would not have seen that. Can you comment, please? I sure can, Senator, and thank you for the question. Uh, true, uh, there was a, a lot of disparity as related to the larger banks in the first tranche, and the coalition took a position as well as other uh, trade associations across the industry. Uh, to give uh, a pot of money or for CDFIs. And I think what you saw was, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, those loan sizes uh, went down way below the average, but also too, you saw more black and brown borrowers. I know for one example, uh, self-help uh, credit union uh, based in North Carolina, 63% of all of their uh, PPP loans went to uh, businesses of color or owned by uh, uh, people of color. And so, again, I think it was effective to give uh, as an alternative to those larger banks, uh, not, not knocking banks, I do work for, for a bank, but but with that said, uh, to give them that alternative to be able to um, uh, access the PPP program, especially in those communities that were hardest hit that were black and brown. So I, I, I'm happy that we were able to advocate on that behalf and I'm happy that uh, CDFIs were able to step up during that crucial time to support those businesses that necessarily did not get that uh, in the first tranche. Well, I think the lesson is that if we're doing a, a support or assistance to small business, CDFI has to be a big part of it. 
but just turning the key o keys over to large institutions will not get the money to where it should be. Again, uh, thank you, Madam, <laughs> Madam Chairman, and thank you, okay. uh, Ranking Member. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Senator Reid. Um, we will now turn to Senator Daines. Chairman Smith, thank you. Um, I'm excited for the subcommittee hearing, actually, because the uh, the CDFIs have played a, a very big role in uh, my home state of Montana. Uh, they continue to play a really vital role in supporting a lot of our underserved communities across our state. In fact, you look at the numbers in Montana, uh, CDFIs have invested more than $218 million. Uh, we look that that spans over about 4,000 loans. And CDFIs in my home state, like MOFI, uh, which operate primarily in Montana, in Idaho, in Wyoming, they've got a really strong track record of boosting economic growth and importantly, uh, creating uh, great jobs. I'm particularly passionate about the new markets tax credit, which provides tax credits for community development entities to make investments in our lower income communities. In fact, uh, we can point to a new uh, YWCA in Missoula, which I happened to tour back in August of uh, 2020. Uh, we have a new wellness center in the Fort Peck Indian Reservation. And so consequently, I've really seen firsthand that the new markets tax credit, it works. And I strongly support making it permanent and would uh, reach out to my colleagues on both sides to suggest we work together to find permanence. Um, so I think one of the frustrating parts of Washington, D.C. is the temporary nature of policies that are good policies. Let's make this one permanent, work together to that outcome. Uh, we recently in Congress extended the NMTC through 2025, which will provide much needed certainty for all stakeholders who utilize and rely on this incentive. Congress has extended it so many times. At this point, I think we should agree when it gets extended so many times, let's just make the uh, temporary nature of it go away entirely and make it permanent. Um, and so I have a question for the whole panel. The question is this, in your mind, what would be some of the benefits of making the credit permanent? And do you think that would make the credit even more effective. And Mr. Holtzclaw, why don't you start off with your, your response to that? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, you know, I, like you like you stated uh, in, in the state of Montana and across the country, uh, the new markets tax credit program has proven to be uh, vitally successful. And I think, uh, and I could not concur with you more in regards to making it permanent because uh, you see every year when uh, people or CDFIs apply or CDEs uh, apply for the program that it's already over prescribed. So the need is there. But again, I think it's a perfect example of a private public partnership to where uh, those outside dollars can be combined with the expertise of the community development entity to impact communities. And so uh, definitely strongly agree in, the, in making it permanent and, and increasing the allocation authority of the new markets tax credit program. Uh, the New Markets Tax Credit Coalition is doing some amazing work advocating on that behalf. And, and with that, I definitely appreciate um, your support. I, I want to defer to some of the other panelists um, if they have any response. Mr. Holzclaw, thank you. Uh, Mr. Altman or Ms. Vogel? Why don't I start Ms. Vogel? you have a thought on that? I'll, I'll, I'll give my time to Mr. Altman. He's got the experience with New Markets Tax Credit. Mr. Altman. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I actually served as the first president of the New Markets Coalition back in uh, that the beginning of the program in 2000. Uh, and so we've been very, very involved over a long period of time to really make this program uh, successful. Uh, it has never been plagued with scandal. Uh, it has been incredibly effective uh, and it should be made permanent. So I pre appreciate uh, your, uh, your your statements there, uh, Senator. Uh, Problem, thank you. A couple uh, of other points yeah, I'd make uh, please. is that uh, it should be indexed uh, for inflation as part of its permanency. Uh, it should be uh, uh, it's, uh, made permanent now when the opportunity is, is, is here. Uh, I know there's been some discussion about waiting until 2025 when this extension rolls out, but the need is now, it should be made permanent. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it should be uh, 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 widely available to CDEs. 
Well, thank you. Ms. Vogel, I know you've spent a lot of time working in Indian country. Um, anything, any thoughts you might want to share on what's worked and what hasn't worked uh, to increase CDFI investment in Indian country? Well, just quickly on the new market tax credits, um, we don't have many investments in Indian country with new market tax credits. A lot of us have tried to innovate and create different models to address that and access the new, new market tax credit to get an allocation. And it hasn't worked successfully. So I would really encourage us all to take a deep look at what are the systemic issues going on with the program that are inhibiting investment into Indian country. And that could take a team at the CDFI fund. So I think there's just some eyes that need to be put on it and percept, you know, the, the way that we perceive things and look, taking a look at things. So we need to be involved in that as an advisory panel and taking a look at things. Vogel, thank you. It's a very helpful comment. Appreciate the observation. Chairman Smith, thank you. I'm out of time. Thank you so much, Senator Daines. Um, now we'll turn to Senator Menendez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, to you and the ranking member for holding this hearing. Uh, throughout the pandemic, we saw that minority and women-owned small businesses were hit particularly hard. At the same time, we saw the vast majority of funding under the Paycheck Protection Program uh, go not to these businesses that were most affected, but to predominantly white-owned businesses with pre-existing relationships with banks. So I'd like to ask Mr. Altman and Ms. Vogel, how did your CDFI work to prioritize lending to the hardest hit small businesses, particularly minority and women owned businesses? I'll, I'll start. Um, this uh, program uh, really brought out the best in CDFIs. Uh, we were able to network uh, with a number of CDFIs that did not have either uh, business lending capacity uh, or were not yet eligible in the first round. Uh, CRF, because we had a, a 7A license, uh, we were able to mount uh, the, the PPP program from day one. Uh, and we, we linked together with organizations around the country that referred their borrowers to us so that we could uh, make those loans and we worked together. They, they would do a lot of the prep work with the borrowers uh, and then we, we, we did the final uh, lending. And that led to uh, $700 million in PPP loans originated by CRF through a network of 47 organizations, including four bands. Uh, and uh, the median loan size of, of those business loans was $21,000. So we really were getting to this, to the mom and pop company, uh, companies, to the very small businesses. And, and uh, two thirds of the loans that we made where we had information uh, on uh, uh, ethnic or racial characteristics were, were made to businesses owned by people of color and or women. Uh, so that is exactly the, the, I think, the way that the CDFI industry uh, was able to partner uh, with, with others. And I should say that on the banking side, um, because the PPP program was so important, we were able to raise hundreds of millions of dollars in credit facilities from large banks uh, to, to fund that uh, PPP activity that we did uh, in, in concert with many other organizations. Yeah, so do you mind if I... No, go right ahead. Okay, thank you for that question. And I think that, you know, our experience was at first of a lot of panic when we found out about PPP program and the inability for us to access a lot of the funds for our borrowers. We had borrowers bringing all of the federal programs, the idle PPP to us and saying, how do we get access to this? Our first instinct was to refer to financial institutions and many of them were not serving borrowers that were outside of their portfolios at the beginning in these small banks. And so we had to, you know, scramble and find a partner and thank goodness CRF had created this tool. And so so we looked for partners alongside that were also giving us a little bit of a kickback because we spent a lot of time, administrative time, packaging the loans, working with the borrowers, getting their you know, balance sheets straight to send off to the next level. And CRF was generous enough to offer something. Many of the other financial institutions just wanted us to send them borrowers without any sort of support back to the CDFI, which was very frustrating. So we're thankful for CRF and what they were able to do. And there were a few others out there that did the mm -hmm. same. We were on the ground trying to get the resources into the hands of the, the community members that needed it the most and successfully did it through partnerships like CRF. Great. Well, to support the important work CDFIs do in New Jersey and for that fact around the country, I led the effort to establish the CDFI bond guarantee program over 10 years ago. That program allows CDFIs to access long-term, low-cost capital to jumpstart economic growth and community development, all 
at no cost to the taxpayers. Mr. Halsclaw, uh, you noted in your testimony that the program has supported $1.3 billion in affordable financing for community facilities, nonprofits, commercial real estate, other community development projects. Could you explain to the committee in more detail how the program helps these projects actually come to life? Thank you, Senator, and thank you for your support of that uh, uh, 10 years ago. I think that, you know, the bond guarantee program has provided, um, again, an opportunity for, for, for the, the folks who have received it always in the, in the, in the, in the desire and access to garner more capital. So I, I think it became a game changer from that standpoint. Now, while we do want to encourage folks uh, or encourage it, the limits to come down to be able to expand it to more individuals. I just think that the the, the way the program is structured just allowed um, more uh, CDFIs or the ones who've been able to access the program, just another avenue or another vehicle on top of the FA, TA programs um, that were already out there and already existed. So again, making that limit go down a little lower, the 25 million as opposed to 100 million will only expand the net even uh, even more for uh, other folks to be able to access that program. And would it, I, Madam Chair, I know I'm out of time, just one last question. It, it, would it be fair to say that if the CDFI bond program had not existed, that some of these projects would not have taken off to the ground? Very fair to say, very right. fair to say. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have other questions, I'll submit them for the record. Thank you so much, Senator Menendez. Uh, next up for questioning, um, unless Senator Tester is with us, which I think he is not, we will go to Senator Cortez Masto from Nevada. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to both you and ranking member for having this hearing. It was so important. I really appreciate the comments from the panel members today and all the good work that you're doing. Let, let me start, uh, Mr. Holesclaw and Mr. Altman, let me talk a little bit about um, uh, the Housing and Economic Recovery Act of 2008 and get your thoughts here. So we all know Congress allowed non-depository community development financial institutions to become members of the federal home loan banks. Oh, Mr. Holesclaw, what has been the impact of providing a secondary market for CDFI loans through the federal home loan banks? Thank you, Senator. A great question. I, I think the it's obvious to see that uh, the number of CDFIs who have joined the federal home loan bank system has increased. When you look in 2011, you had eight. If you look at 2021, you now have 60, 67. So uh, as we all know, that system exists uh, to support housing opportunities and community development, much like CDFIs do as well. And so through this membership, uh, as we talked about throughout this testimony, CDFIs are always on the lookout for affordable uh, sources of capital. And I think that the federal home loan bank uh, system has given uh, our members or our industry the low cost, flexible on demand capital that they need through these advances. And I think that CDFIs are able to take this capital and use it as a funding source for mortgage products for very low and low to moderate income communities. And so I think that uh, as the banks offer their letter of credits to CDFIs to help secure these additional uh, uh, obligations, I think you're just going to see the numbers rise uh, as, the, as the, the need or fight for capital is going to become more apparent as we move on. And so with the CDFIs becoming the shareholders of the bank, uh, they can also earn high yielding investments and can participate in all the various programs that um, the federal home loan bank system provides. Like, for example, the federal home loan, uh, I mean, federal uh, uh, bank of New York has grant programs that support lending for disaster relief, affordable housing, and, and home buyers. So I think, Senator, as time goes on, you're only going to see those numbers increase from 67 on up. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great, and that, that's a positive, and uh, I think it's wonderful to hear uh, the benefits from the change uh, in the law. But it, I also know that, unfortunately, the law did not permit community development financial institutions to join as community financial institutions. Um, and that has also had an impact. And so, Mr. Altman, I appreciate the Community Reinvestment Fund support of a bill that I've introduced uh, to allow CDFIs to pledge small business, small agriculture, and community development loans to receive advances from the federal home loan banks. 
So, uh, Mr. Altman, how would the opportunity to pledge non-housing loans to the Federal Home Loan Bank affect your and other community development financial institutions? Uh, it would be very, very helpful. Uh, we've looked uh, over time since this uh, opportunity to be become a member of the uh, of the Federal Home Loan Bank, uh, and we've decided that we couldn't uh, because of the collateral requirements, uh, uh, just not having the right collateral uh, to meet the, the standards of the bank or having the right kind of collateral to get a significant advance. Uh, so we've gone elsewhere for liquidity. Now that said, we have been supported outside of membership uh, by investments uh, made by the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago. And I know other federal home loan banks have looked at other ways to support CDFIs. But CDFI membership, I think, would be great, greatly enhanced uh, by, the, by the bill that you are, uh, are, have introduced. Yeah, and no, I appreciate that because I think all, my understanding is just in 2008 it was a drafting error more than any opposition to allowing this to occur. And so I would encourage my colleagues to support uh, my proposal to permit non-depository CDFIs to pledge the same collateral as other community financial institutions. And then um, uh, to the chairwoman, I would request permission to place into the record the 2015 GAO report, Federal Home Loan Banks, Collateral requirements discourage some community development financial institu institutions from seeking membership. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. And I, I know I only have so much time left, but here's the other thing that I'm going to ask the panel members to help with. Um, I, I think we all do, and this is a great opportunity here to see bipartisan work happening. We all support greater investments in community development financial institutions. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I am aware that these entities entities exist unevenly uh, across the nation. There is only one treasury certified CDFI in Nevada. In the past 30 years, we have had only eight awards to a Nevada based CDFI. So uh, my question to Mr. Holzpah is how can the CDFI coalition assist the development of CDFIs in underserved states like Nevada? What should we be considering? How do we bring more of those resources into a community that is underserved? Uh, the Senator, I would say, uh, the time I have left, uh, obviously uh, advocate for more technical assistance dollars for emerging CDFIs in Nevada. Also uh, work to increase uh, the small and emerging CDFI program or SECA. And then last but not least, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are webinars, there are other things uh, that uh, emerging CDFIs can do. Uh, and I know we as a coalition have a lot of Western-based rule uh, CDFI members, and I'm more than happy to, 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 to talk to your staff to, to bring folks together uh, and, and, and put you all in touch with them. Thank you. And I, I'm looking forward to that because I, I know about the technical assistance funds. They're just not reaching Nevada. So if there's a way that, that we can get you your support and kind of innovation ideas about how we do this and grow this in Nevada, I, I would be open to that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I want to thank you and Senator Rounds for bringing us together uh, on this important hearing today. And to all the panelists, uh, thank you for your input. Uh, also good to see my, my friend and colleague, Senator Warner, and it was good to work with him and others uh, in providing that big bump up uh, to CDFIs as part of the bill we passed last December. And I do have a couple questions regarding the status of, of, of the rollout there. Uh, but first, um, I also serve on the Appropriations Committee, and I chair the subcommittee that oversees the appropriations uh, through the Department of Treasury to CDFIs. And we've been working on a bipartisan basis to try to increase funding uh, for CDFIs, given the critical role uh, they play in economic development at the community level. Uh, and we've unveiled a proposed budget uh, for, the, for this fiscal year that we're now in. Um, for fiscal year 2022 uh, that would increase uh, the CDFI allocation by $90 million, uh, take it to $360 million from the current amount of $270 million. So my, my first question to Mr. Holdsclaw is, uh, do you agree in that CDFIs have the capacity to absorb this additional funding? And what would be the consequences if we're not able uh, to provide the additional funding if we simply straight line uh, CDFI funding at, at current levels. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, I do think, uh, I think 
if COVID has proven nothing else uh, in, in, in what CDFIs were able to do um, is that CDFIs can uh, be the first line of financial defense uh, for underserved communities across the country. So I do feel like, and thank you for your support of the appropriations levels, that CDFIs would be able to absorb that increased amount. I think that uh, uh, the performance during, during COVID has shown that. Uh, Regards to the second part of your question, uh, obviously all CDFIs uh, worry and are concerned about access to capital and, and, and loan production and whatnot. I just feel like the need is so great uh, that I would have a hard time finding what would be necessarily detrimental to to, to those type of funds. And then also too, Senator, I, I don't know if you were here during my testimony, but I also talked about not only that money going to the CDFIs, but also the fund being able to have enough administrative uh, support internally to deal with the demand of uh, surge of applications for certified CDFIs going on right now, as well as the awarding of, uh, of uh, uh, grants and allocation authority from last year. Uh, they're very short staffed, but I think there's also a play there as well. CDFIs can get a lot of that money from an FA and TA standpoint. I think there's also two, uh, uh, a desire from from the coalition standpoint for us to support the CDF I fund from an administrative uh, standpoint. No, I appreciate that, and I think that's one of the things we'd like to do and, and work with you and, and your members uh, uh, to make sure that uh, we do that. We want to obviously we got to support the folks at Treasury who are administering the program and the folks in the field. Uh, so I, I referred to the December bill and the two big programs that are still in the process of implementation. There's the Emergency Capital Investment Program and the Emergency Support and Minority Lending Program. Uh, based on the feedback you're hearing, um, are there any concerns with the, the rollout that we should be aware of uh, at this particular point, or do things seem to be going smoothly? Please. Uh Putting aside the issue of the fact that non-depository institutions cannot participate, and I agree with my colleagues uh, who would like to remedy that situation. Right. From, from, from our membership, Senator, we're not hearing um, anything negative in regards to the rapid uh, response. And then, obviously, a couple of weeks ago, the the ECP the ECIP program. Uh, you know, when, when I would check in with some of the folks who were able to to garner uh, some of that money, I would hear things like, you know transformational game changer again, because uh, especially from a lot of the minority deposit institutions that I reached out to, um, I had a conversation with the second oldest CEO of the second oldest black bank in the country in Durham, North Carolina. And he just said, uh, it, you know, it's unbelievable what that's gonna allow him to be able to do. Great, no, I think this is something that, um, you know, we're all, we're all proud of the funds that are made available and look forward to working with you. Um, my, my final question, um, really Mr. Altman, relates to providing an opportunity for more CDFIs to participate as lenders under the SBA programs. Um, this was um, an issue that, you know, really came to a head, I think, during this uh, pandemic and the PPP programs. Uh, we saw that CDFIs could be very important conduits uh, for those funds, but we don't have enough CDFIs who are certified uh, with SBA programs, what what do you think uh, we can and should be doing in that regard? Well, <clears throat> two things. I think uh, more CDFIs ought to have uh, access to the license that we have. Uh, there are only 14 of these national non-bank uh, SBA 7A licenses, and uh, uh, only three CDFIs hold those at this point. Uh, it does allow us to be a national lender, which is important. Uh, then the, CD, the SBA also has been uh, operating a pilot program called Community Advantage that uh, allows uh, CDFIs to make uh, SBA guaranteed loans uh, up to $250,000. That program should be made permanent, and I believe there's been legislation introduced to uh, make it permanent uh, because it is a, a vital tool, and many of the CDFIs that were part of that uh, pilot program were able to access uh, the uh, PPP program uh, very effectively. Uh, and then I think there's a, a there's another aspect to all of this, and that is the role of uh, technology in in supporting uh, the lending that CDFIs do in the SBA world. Uh, SBA uh, loan origination is a complicated process, uh, and uh, CRF has developed a, a platform called Spark that uh, that CDFIs are now using to originate their SBA loans. Uh, but it's it's it, it's a it's a 
It's a very, very useful uh, and forward-looking um, platform that I think is a, it, it's important for the CDFI world to be able to access technology platforms uh, uh, as banking is doing right now. And so that should be part of the SBA uh, discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you so much, Senator Van Hall, and I certainly so much appreciate your leadership on the Appropriations Subcommittee. And Senator Warner, welcome to the subcommittee. It is great to have you, given your deep interest and commitment to um, supporting CDFI. So thank you for being with us. Well, thank you, Chair Smith, and um, you know, really appreciate the fact that you and Senator Rounds are holding this hearing and thank the panel. I think CDFIs, I think we've all, at least I speaking personally, have come to much more fully understand the incredibly valuable role they play in our financial system and frankly the opportunity to expand that role and i i want to thank senator van holland for his work as an appropriator to make sure that we take this moment and continue to expand it uh, i am very proud of the fact that uh, so many of us on this committee in a bipartisan way work so hard to get that 12 billion dollars you know that came out of the jobs and neighborhood investment act into the last COVID package and I, I think, as Senator Van Hollen pointed out in his line of questioning, the rollout's been pretty darn good. You know, the, the grants went out the first round, the second round will come out later. The fact that we had close to what was it, almost $13 billion of requests on the ESIP program. Uh, and so we were way oversubscribed on, on that item. Uh, you know, shows, I think, the capacity of this, uh, of this group of institutions, obviously serving underserved communities. And, you know, I think we need to, work as well as what Senator Cortez Masto talked about is how do we expand this, uh, the network of CDFIs in a much, much greater way. So I want to hit two or three points pretty quickly. First, uh, I'm going to start with Mr. Altman. I'm, I'm really interested in this whole idea of can we take CDFI portfolios and securitize it? Uh, I think that's the next big step we need to move to. I've had conversations with the Fed. I know, Mr. Altman, that uh, CRF, your entity, has uh, done some securitizations in the past. I think, uh, uh, you know, what else should we be able to do? What, are, what tools, do you need additional tools from Congress? Do we need to continue to nudge the Fed? How can we, can we make either on an individual basis or on a, an ability to aggregate pools of, of loans from a variety of CDFIs into uh, a more easily securitization process. Thank you for that question. Uh, we we actually did uh, pioneer the, the use of uh, uh, securitization as a uh, as a tool uh, early on, uh, and we've uh, securitized through uh, 21 different uh, issues. Uh, securitized mostly small business and nonprofit loans, but also uh, uh, close to 100 million dollars in multifamily affordable housing loans. Uh, and those securities, at least the, the latter ones that we did, were large enough to be rated by uh, Standard & Poor's, uh, something that people said will never happen. Uh, and this, is, this was all done without any uh, particular government support uh, other than ma maintaining uh, compliance with uh, uh, tax laws and so forth. Uh, after the crash, uh, the, the, the market for securities just collapsed and uh, we had to move in a different direction. Uh, and then the counting rules changed and uh, required, uh, even though securitizations are, on, uh, are, are bankruptcy remote, usually done through special purpose vehicles, uh, it required uh, the special purpose vehicles to come back onto the balance sheets of the issuer. So uh, that made it virtually impossible for an organization like CRF to continue to securitize without having a much larger balance sheet. Uh, and so we moved to other tools uh, because the balance sheet just wasn't there to support it from an accounting perspective. Uh, and I think that's, that's one of the issues that needs to be examined. Uh, uh, the, the second issue is securitization works the best when the assets that are being securitized are standardized. And CDFIs in general, and uh, we, we certainly came to the, the market recognizing this, CDFIs in general do their own thing. Uh, and the ability to create standardized products that can be fed into a security is, is still a challenge, uh, but once we have standardized products, and I will use the PPP product as a, as a prime example, that was a standardized product across the entire industry, uh, and it became very liquid. And so uh, CDFIs need to have the ability to, if they want to securitize, to create products that are the same across different CDFIs. Not that all their products are the same, 
but that the ones that they want to securitize can be put into facilities uh, that are of like uh, benefit. So th those would be my my basic comments. Well, on we'd, we'd like to keep working with you on this because we've had conversations with both the Fed on potentially creating SPVs and yes. with private capital. And that's where I want to move my uh, my last question to, which is how do we better leverage private capital? And I'd love to hear from Mr. Holtzclaw as well on this and the, the balance of the pa panel because you private cap, there's a lot of talk from, from private capital about wanting to get in. Uh, you know, I know some large entities like Google have been pretty creative in using their balance sheet, but I think that could help us on, on securitization. And I um, also want to make sure that uh, some of them, some of the CDFIs and MDIs in particular that are most in need couldn't meet all the requirements even to get the ESIP program. So is there also a way where some of this private capital that might be more at risk can can help smaller and, and other entities. So I know my time's up, Madam Chair, but if I could have the panel answer on how we can better leverage private capital, I'd love to hear from everybody, starting with Mr. Holtzclaw. Uh, thank you, Senator, and thank you for your uh, past support for, for CFIs. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, in the wake of the, the, the racial and social reckoning that we had uh, last, last year coming from the, the George Floyd, I think you saw this influx of private corporations uh, coming together and, and making deposits into MDIs uh, and others. I think that, uh, as well as foundations, I, I think that um, I would say one way to increase increase it is to look at these small and emerging CDFIs again uh, to try to get some of those, like you said, those MDIs who aren't able to do ECIP to be able to get and foster those relationships between them as well. Because again, we 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 have this gap where some folks were unable to capitalize off of it and some were not, uh, some were and some were not. And so I think that just the continuing education and bringing folks together outside of some type of racial and social reckoning to, to show that CFIs are, are here, they're, 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 you know, they're first responders from a financial standpoint uh, and educating other folks about the smaller and emerging ones, I think will level the playing field from a, a private investment standpoint. Others, I know my time's up, but I, I, I don't want to, I'm not a subcommittee member. And I don't want to overdo, I, I, I will go back to the chair, but Madam Chair, I just, one of the things I hope the subcommittee would look at as well, you know, we know that Lael Brainerd in her previous role was leading the efforts on uh, CRA reform. I'd, I'd love to get maybe for the record from the, from the panel, how we can use CRA reform to also help with CDFIs. And thank you and Senator Round so much for holding this hearing. Thank you so much, Senator Warner. And I think those are all great, great issues to follow up on. Look forward to continuing to work with you on on this. Thank you. So I, uh, I believe, unless I am mistaken and not seeing anybody, I believe that everybody who is interested has gone through their first round of questions. So let me turn to Senator Rounds. Senator Rounds, would you like to ask a second round of questions? At this time, I, I think I've had my questions answered, and, and it's actually been a very good subcommittee hearing. I think uh, we've had some very good participation by members, not just of the subcommittee, but other members of the banking committee as well. I think this has been a good informational meeting. And I think uh, with regard to some new ideas and so forth, it's, it's been a very beneficial meeting. And I, I thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and, and I would defer at this time. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I actually do have just a couple of uh, follow-ups that I'd like to uh, ask the panel before uh, we close and um, so let me just get to those quickly. The first is this, um, you know, when the pandemic struck in 2020, a lot of state legislatures, including my state legislatures, developed some economic relief packages for small businesses and they um, turned to CDFIs. CDI, CDFIs stepped up to help in distributing these funds so that they got to traditionally underserved communities. And now I have heard that some of these CDFIs in Minnesota are facing challenges getting maintaining um, or getting certification because those emergency loans were outside of the narrow definition of their target market. And let me just ask, um, so let me just finish by saying the CDFI fund at the Department of Treasury, which sets these rules, has provided some target market exemptions for PPP loans, but hasn't done the same for the state funded pandemic loans. Um, Mr. Altman, I just want to turn to you about this. I'm wondering if you've heard about this and if you have any recommendations or thoughts that we can take back to Treasury. 
Yes, yes, it is a challenge. Uh, when we, we're a national organization. Uh, there are there are several different ways the CDFI fund uh, permits uh, our uh, target markets. Low income targeted populations is one where you literally have to show that low income people directly were benefiting, or by using proxies like uh, being a residents of affordable multifamily housing and others. Uh, there's another one called uh, investment areas, and that is a geography uh, that has been established by the uh, CDFI fund uh, uh, based on certain characteristics of census tracts. Investment areas uh, tend to be uh, limited and are held accountable by advisory committees. So for an organization that's national like CRF is and several other CDFIs, uh, it's impossible to have uh, at 50 advisory committees to be able to operate in investment areas nationally. So we really advocate for a reform there to enable uh, uh, national uh, investment areas uh, uh, under that target market test. And then there's, a, there's other targeted markets at, which tend to be um, uh, specific uh, ethnic or, or racial groups uh, that are uh, target markets for CDFIs. And oftentimes the accountability mechanism there uh, is also limiting so uh, accountability is very important. Oftentimes CDFIs use their boards uh, as an accountability mechanism. Um, uh, that needs to be streamlined, I think. And then finally, this uh, issue that you're raising, Senator, uh, of uh, CDFIs being asked to, to, to take up uh, the sort of frontline effort, but then being restricted in where, where or, with, or to whom they can uh, lend is an issue. And I think uh, during this period of recovery, uh, uh, the, after the pandemic, the CDFI fund needs to provide some relief to, CR, to CDFIs who might be lending for uh, mission-related purposes, but ne not necessarily inside of their target markets. Mr. Holtzclaw, would you like to add to that? I'm sure, I wonder if you've heard about this as well. I, ha I have heard about it, Senator. Um, and again, it, it, and you're going to probably, if it's not corrected, you're going to start to see more and more of this because you're you're having more states now that are developing programs that are CDFI specific. I mean, one of the things that we've thought about at the coalition is is uh, to try to get everybody on the same page is to have a, a stakeholder meeting uh, to renew the discussion uh, on the proposed rule and 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 also note that there's some. Again, as as Frank stated, some some complications as it relates to the targeted market certification, and so we'd like to be able to sit down uh, in, in 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 the stakeholder meeting and hash some of these things out and help the fund um, as they start to deal with more and more of these issues. Well, thank you. I look forward to working with you on and everyone on that. I think this is a, we, we, this is something that we should be able to find a solution to. Last question I just want to highlight before I close is um, several of you in your testimony mentioned the role that CDFIs can help in expanding uh, child care uh, businesses. Um, this is such an important issue at a moment where we are seeing workforce shortages and we are seeing deep challenges in the child care sector um, caused by the pandemic, but really challenges that existed way before the pandemic. Um, this seems to me to be a really important opportunity. So, um, Mr. Holzkar, let me just um, stay with you. Um, is there anything more that you'd like to say just to highlight the importance role that CDFIs can play in addressing this challenge of childcare shortages and childcare deserts? I, I would, uh, Chairwoman, uh, and you, you got me in my sweet spot as a proud uh, Head Start child and, uh, and having the opportunity to have visited parents and community action Head Start in uh, Minnesota. Uh, I think that, uh, in my mind, the child care piece of what a lot of CDFIs do across the country is probably one of the most uh, least known about. Um, you've got organizations like CEI in Maine that have a 40-year track record of, of working with child care facilities uh, from a finance standpoint, but there's also a development services point here as well, because CDFIs also have a mission of providing those development services, which is more or less uh, them helping build the capacity for a uh, uh, child care center that's trying to open early care and education. Uh, and, and so I, I think that they play a great role, but it's one that we probably need to do a, a better job of highlighting. I'd be happy to send uh, over to the office uh, any information that we have in regards to some of the programs that our members uh, um, have from a child care uh, center standpoint and finance facility. Thank you so much. And then Ms. Vogel, I'll close with you because I know that this is an issue that you're deeply um, committed to and passionate about. Um, congratulations, by the way, on being a finalist for the 
uh, Build Back Better regional challenge um, in this area. So would you like to say anything more about this? Yeah, I think I think daycares are, um, you know, such an important and vital part of any economy, including the rural economies, and they're a hard um, business model to fund in a traditional way. And so CDFIs can step up in a role and create unique financial products um, to match the daycare model, if, you know, because it's a hybrid of almost a social program um, and it's underfunded funded federally. So it definitely needs more federal support for daycare centers across the nation. But as, as far as what CDFIs can do, we can, if we can get access to more flexible capital to offer more patient capital, you know, lower interest rates for these types of models, it'll really help. And then as developers within our community, we Forbans is looking at, you know, building the buildings and then helping with the operations costs to offset the cost to the, the actual family, family member to make it more affordable to, to our community through the Build Back Better regional competition, hopefully. So thank you for, for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Well, you are exactly right. It's a question of facilities and upgrading and improving facilities that we need to support more as well as making the business model for childcare actually function for parents and for providers um, where we have situations where you know, providers are making, um, you know, bare, not even enough to support their families at the same time that parents are priced out of childcare because it's so expensive. So there's many opportunities here. Um, I want to just thank all of our panelists for a terrific, uh, a terrific discussion today about the opportunities that we have to support community development financial institutions. Senator Rounds, thank you so much for, again, for um, the opportunity to work together. I think that we have heard a lot today um, about areas of bipartisan um, opportunity to come together, in, um, including the two bills that you and I are I'm leading on the bond guarantee program and also the section 502 mortgage lending program, but other areas where we can find good bipartisan agreement, including new market tax credits. And I hope also um, providing uh, increased funding uh, for CDFI. So I look forward to continuing our work together on this. Um, I want to thank everybody. Um, thanks to our witnesses for being here today and providing your testimony. And for senators who wish to submit questions for the record, those questions are due one week from today, which will be Wednesday, January 12th. For our witnesses, you will have 45 days to respond to any questions for the record. Um, thank you again. And with that, our hearing is adjourned.